السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد um, So I'm not going to talk about my topic Just want to let you know ahead of time So everybody's okay with that, inshallah um, It is a wonderful topic uh, But, you know, in these kinds of uh, opportunities I'd rather get some specific messages across uh, that I think are relevant to youth uh, that I don't get to talk about in other forums, inshallah ta'ala. So these 20 minutes, maybe at the most 25 minutes or so that I have, I'm going to talk about just some lessons from the Ashab al-Kahf. I'll just highlight some things uh, and just discuss some things that I feel very strongly are missing in uh, Muslim discourse, especially that has to do with our youth. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is a cultural onslaught. The first thing we'll take from the people of the cave, Ashab al-Kahf, is that they drew themselves away from a, a dominant culture. They pulled themselves away. When they saw that it was overwhelmingly evil, and they had no way of escaping that culture, ex and actually the verdict was given that they were to be executed as a result of their faith, they pulled themselves out of that culture. And one of the most important things to draw from that for ourselves is until our life is in danger, we have to engage in society. It is only when their life was actually threatened that the, these young men left society, that they you know, withdrew towards a cave because their actual lives were in danger. Muslims cannot have the attitude that we're not going to engage in society and somehow everything outside is a fitna and we have to protect ourselves, and we have to shelter ourselves, and the only way that we're going to keep our faith is if we keep guarding ourselves totally, shunning ourselves from the outside world. This, is, this attitude actually means we've already accepted defeat. Because at the end of the day, that attitude means defense. That attitude means that everybody else is attacking us, and we've got to save ourselves and pull back and you know, stay strong within our fort, etc. But the entire idea of Islam being the truth, the imagery that Allah presents of Islam, you know, Allah Azza wa Jal says, you know, uh, that Allah hurls, نَقْذِفُ بِالْحَقَّ عَلَى الْبَاطِلِ فَيَدْمَغُهُ That we hurl the truth against falsehood. Allah gives the image of truth being a weapon and falsehood being the victim of that weapon running away. And the truth attacking falsehood and falsehood being on the run. So who's on the offense and who's on the defense? Who's actually questioning the wrong that's happening in society and engaging with it and saying we're here to change things? And who's actually supposed to go into hiding and supposed to hide behind shelter? That's supposed to be falsehood. So the mentality of the Muslims generally, especially of Muslim youth, isn't supposed to be I have to save myself, but actually I have to engage and I have to help the world become a better place. That's the first thing I want to get across. The second thing I want to get across is Allah Azza wa Jal usually does not do this. He usually does not highlight the age of people when he talks about them. He doesn't normally do that. We don't learn the age of Musa alayhi salam when he went to the mountain. We don't learn about that. Very, very rarely does he do that. Like for example, Allah Azza wa Jal talks about Musa alayhi salam when he became a mature adult or when Yusuf alayhi salam became a mature adult. Their ages are talked about. But usually the people's age is not mentioned, as though it's a non-factor. But when it came to the people of the cave, these, the sleepers of the cave as they're called, Ashab al-Kahf, Allah Azza wa Jal said, innahum fityatun. Even though without the word fitya, the sentence is complete, innahum fitya, or innahum amanu bi rabbihim. Without the word fitya, the sentence is completely fine. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, no doubt about it, they were in fact young people. Amanu bi rabbihim, that believed in their master. Allah Azza wa wants us to know their age, wants us to know that they're young. Because especially when you are young, you are more susceptible to follow the culture around you. You're more susceptible to accept the pressures of society. You're more susceptible to want to be like everybody else. Why wouldn't you be? I mean, it is when you go to high school that you start feeling the, the pressure of being different from other people. It's when people start saying things to you that make you feel like, man, why am I so different than everybody else? And then you feel the pressure to wanting to dress like the other, to look like the other, to talk like the other, you know? 
So even if you're religious and, you know, you want to grow a beard or something, it's the pencil thing, you know. <laughs> it's a little more hip. It's a little more, it fits in better, you know. And we start assimilating ourselves more and more at that age, at a younger age. These young men are highlighted as people who understood the values of their faith and where the faith and culture clash against each other and they're going to hold on to their faith no matter what. And if time comes that they can't even live anymore, like holding on to Islam for them meant losing their life, then they'd rather not even live in that society. They'd rather just leave that society. They, they chose a cave over that, subhanAllah. The idea I'm trying to present here is youth are actually the pillars of strength, not the weakness. So many conferences being held about the problems of the youth, the fitna of the youth. We have to save our youth. No, the youth have to save us. <laughs> It's the other way. You guys have to realize the position you're in. You have to realize the responsibility that's set on you. I'm happy that Sheikh Umar talked about you know, vision and setting goals, because that's really what I wanted to talk to you about in these 10, 15 minutes, is vision and setting goals. I am personally offended by Muslim youth who go to college, and they're in their junior year, senior year, and they're like, yeah, I'm majoring in blah, 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 but I'm not sure. I don't know. You ask a student, what, what are you going to do in school? I'm going to do accounting. Why are you doing it? Ah, I don't know. Just, I guess. What is that? You have no sense of direction? Not in, not in deed and not in dunya. Not in deed and not in dunya. And this is unacceptable. Muslim youth have to have a very clear sense of direction. A very clear sense of purpose. And if you don't have it, you better start working on finding it now. What are you good at? And how are you going to put it to the service of Allah's deen? And I say aim really, really high. Aim extremely high. Allah has put us in a, an incredible opportunity in the United States. So many Muslim youth around the world are, don't have this opportunity that we have here in the United States. I'm talking about what we can do for, the, for our deen. And what we can accomplish even in terms of dunya. And how we can use the dunya to do more for our deen. If, we have, if we're a people of vision. Everybody else that's going to school and going to college is thinking about where they're going to get a job. How much money they're going to save. Where they're going to get their first apartment. What their first car is going to be. When are they going to get married. Those are the thoughts of everybody else because that's the highest they can think. They can't think past that. They don't know there's anything beyond that. But the Muslim youth, the one that has vision, the one that has purpose, says, you know, I am going to graduate. And yes, I will get a job. And I will get a place. And I will get a car. And I will get married and all of that. But you know what? I have bigger purpose. I'm going to use my career to do something huge. I have this idea that I think will really benefit the ummah. I have this idea that will really further the message of Islam. I have this idea that will really benefit society, people in general. And I'm going to run with that idea. I'm going to do something towards that. And I'm going to use my education and my inspiration from deen and combine those two things and here's how I'm going to accomplish it. Here's my five-year plan. Here's what I see myself doing in ten, 10 years. Here was, here's what I see myself doing in 15 years. Goals for yourself. Targets for yourself. You have to set those. You can't just wing it. It doesn't work. Then we don't accomplish anything. You know, the famous Arabic poet, piece of poetry I teach every year at my campus to the students. One of the first things I teach them is, Whoever fears climbing the mountain stays forever in the ditch. Aim high. And so in these few minutes, I just want to talk to you practically about just a couple of groundwork, some basic foundational things that will help you aim high, inshallah ta'ala, and help myself aim high. As far as our religious maturity is concerned. Every one of us should see ourselves next year, you know, from this Ramadan to next Ramadan, or you know what, Ramadan's already over. So this December to next December, this winter to next winter, how am I going to be a better Muslim? And I, I'd like to highlight three areas. So for those of you that are writing this down, just three areas where you want to be able to say to yourself in a tangible way, I'm, a, I'm better off. I've made some progress in three areas at least. The first of those areas is worship. The first concern is worship. Has my fajr improved? 
Am I making Isha and Fajr at least on time perfectly? The guys, am I waking up for Fajr and making it to the masjid? Make it a goal. Maybe you're not doing it every day, but set a goal that you're going to accomplish that this year. More and more and more, you're going to be able to get it. And I'm going to go to sleep earlier. Oh my God, youth, you can't accomplish anything in life if you don't go to sleep early. I'm telling you, you know those deep conversations you have over hookah at night? Yeah, that's not reviving the ummah. Let me just tell you now. That was deep, bros. Good, good talk, good talk. Then you wake up at 10 a.m. to pray Fajr. You know, that's the ummah sure going to revive through that. There was some deep discussions last night over some shawarma and some hookah. You know, go to sleep on time. Go to sleep on time. Wake up early. Set, get your Fajr right. Get your Quran in the morning. Inna Quran al Fajri kana mashhudan. Get your Quran in order. We talk about changing the world. We, ha we can't even change our day yet. We can't even change our day yet. When you change your day, then you can change your year. That means you can change your life. But you start with your day. There's a daily goal. My mornings have to become more productive in terms of worship. In terms of worship. Part of worship, I would include, especially those of you that are people of vision, your vision will come, your inspiration will come with the Qur'an. And the Qur'an has to be in your heart. You have to have a project of memorizing as much Qur'an as you can. As little at a time as possible. If you can handle more, take on more. But every day, fajr and a little bit of memorization, a little bit of recitation, and that's what starts your day. And I can guarantee you, if you do that in your life, even if you do that this week once, if you do it once, you will notice the difference the rest of the day. You will notice that day has more barakah in it, you're getting more accomplished. The doors around you are opening, opportunities are coming, your mind is clearer, creative ideas are coming to you. It's, you'll see it's, Allah brings those blessings to you, those, opens those doors that are otherwise closed. So the first of how many areas did I say? I said three areas and the first of those areas is worship. That's the first area I'm going to improve in. The second area that you really have to work on, that you really, really have to be concerned with, is knowledge. Is knowledge. And how am I going to grow in my knowledge this year? And by the way, I separate knowledge from worship. I separate the two. Because some people focus so much on knowledge and their worship is terrible. They don't worship. They think their knowledge is compensating them for it. So they're studying lots of tafsir and they know a lot of tajweed, but they don't even pay attention in salat. I mean, what are you doing? What's that knowledge for? Your first, I'm, I'm mentioning these things in priority. First thing was worship. The second thing is knowledge. And I don't mean become a alim and get a degree in sharia. Those of you that want to do that, congratulations. I'm talking to everybody here. Not everybody here is going to be a mufti or a alim or whatever. But you have to be educated Muslims. You have to be, at, at, there needs to be some minimal level of education in your Islam. And my recommendation for you for that is that by the end of the year, the coming year, you've studied at least a couple of things. You've studied the seerah, the life of the Prophet وسلم, once. And I, you should do it every year once. And actually you should read a different source on the seerah every year for the next few years. And really study it. So if you take one book of, don't ask me which book you should read on the seerah, read all of them. But take one at a time. Take one and go through it one year. Then go again to the seerah again. Again another year. Then again another year. And you, you know what? Because that is the life of that man sallallahu alayhi wa is our vision, is our inspiration. So you have to keep going back to it. That's a part of your education. And it'll give you perspective and it will open doors for, for reflection and contemplation for you, that study of seerah in and of itself. There are wonderful resources on that available, and there, I, I don't think you'll have any trouble finding them, inshallah ta'ala. At the same time, you have to make substantial gains. In that same year, you have to make substantial gains in your Qur'an. I'm still in the area of knowledge. First area was worship, second area is knowledge, right? In this knowledge, you have to make some substantial gains in your Qur'an, which Let's just say you decided this year you're going to try to memorize, I don't know, Surah Al-Kahf. Let's just say. So you set a goal. For this, this year, I'm going to memorize Surah Al-Kahf. That means I'm going to memorize it. I'm going to study its tafsir. I'm going to read it in translation. I'm going to try to understand every word in its vocabulary. If there's a lecture series on Surah Al-Kahf, if there's a tafsir available on Surah Al-Kahf, if there's an article and paper on Surah Al-Kahf, 
I'm going to take it and I'm going to consume it. This is Surah Al-Kahf year for me. Next year might be Surah Al-Rahman year. The year after that might be Surah Al-Baqarah year. I don't know. Maybe it's a couple of surahs a year. But every year you make a substantial gain in your Quran. Tangible. And don't just say I'm going to study the Quran. Don't do that. And don't just pick random passages. Take a surah, take a couple of surahs and focus. My biggest criticism of Muslim youth today is we don't have focus. Focus on one thing. Get it right. At least you can look back and say, Alhamdulillah, this year I accomplished one more surah, two more surahs, three more surahs, something. And when you study a surah, you don't just learn its meanings. As a student came up and asked me, what's more important, you think? Understanding the Quran or memorizing it? And I said, how do you think that those two things are separate? Why do you think that? You know why we memorize the Quran? So we can repeat it over and over again. And when we repeat the ayat over and over again, Allah gives us more room to think and reflect more and more. And you start seeing things when you recite something 10 times that you didn't see when you recited it 9 times. He opens more doors. Wallahi, this is true of the Qur'an. The more you recite it, the more you understand it. And the less you recite it, the less you understand it. It's not like any other book. And memorizing it is a fundamental piece of understanding it. It is a fundamental of understanding it. So the surah you're going to study and understand better be the surah you're memorizing. Those two things go hand in hand. So I talked about seerah and I talked about Qur'an. Now I'll add one light elective. This is your Islamic semester for the year, for yourself, right? I'll add an elective to this, this semester. And the, the elective is at least three or four du'as. Four du'as, you, you studied them, you memorized them, and they became a part of your day. This is actually combining knowledge and, oh, I got 10, 10 minutes is like an eternity. I don't need 10 minutes. But that's okay. You know, memorizing a few du'as from the Prophet Wasallam that you can make a part of your day. Now you're combining knowledge with practice. You're combining both of those things, okay? And actually each of these three areas of knowledge that I mentioned, and I didn't mention others, I know there's fiqh, I know there's aqidah, I know there's tafsir, I know there's other areas of knowledge. I, I mentioned these three things on purpose because these three things will make you a better Muslim immediately. Immediately they start having a practical impact on you. Your salah starts improving because you're reciting Quran that you've understood. You know, your love of the Prophet ﷺ is increasing because you're learning about his life every year. So every time you send salawat upon him, it's, it's deeper. That salawat, those salawat are deeper felt. Your knowledge of dua is bringing you closer to Allah because now you know what you're asking him. You know what you're actually asking him. Now, this is knowledge. So the first thing was worship and the second thing was? Knowledge, and I hope you see how I tried to fuse those two things too. Even though I kept them separate, one is helping the other. So if your knowledge is not helping your worship, I don't know if it's real knowledge. I, I don't know if that's real knowledge, it, it, in terms of deen. In terms of deen. Then there's the third area, and that is service. There's service. And that's where you have to figure out, you have to set some time, whether it's once a week, whether it's on the weekends, you don't need the screen anyway. If it was on the weekends, whether it's, you know, um, once in a month, but you have to do some kind of service, meaning, meaning help people. Help people. And that doesn't mean that you necessarily have to do this under an Islamic banner. If you want to volunteer at Habitat for Humanity, do it. It's okay, it'll be cool to see a bearded guy helping out with that too. It'll be cool. We don't have to do things under our own banner. Good causes are good causes. Whether Christians are doing them, Jews are doing them, you know, you know, the Gates Foundation is doing them, it doesn't matter. If it's a good cause, you can be a part of it. And actually, personally, I recommend Muslims to be part of good causes that are run by non-Muslims so they get to see that Muslims care too. And it gives them an opportunity to ask Muslims questions about Islam. It gives them that opportunity. So volunteer, help out. Be part of something, something you feel passionately about. And just do that for yourself. Don't publicize it, don't tweet about it. Just helped out, volunteered today. Feel really good, alhamdulillah. Humble brag. Like, don't, don't do that. Just do it for yourself. It will make you a better human being. You'll, be, you'll become a better person when you do these kinds of... And parents, those of you that have parents that, are, that have teenage children, 
If you can encourage that sort of activity and even be, take part in it with your teenage kids, it's actually most important in teenage years to engage in the activity of helping other people. That's part of what builds maturity. Because the teenage years are when our youth, our youth in general, not just Muslim youth, youth in general are the most self-absorbed. They're really just, their world is themselves and how they look and their friends and their Facebook status or how many friends they have or whatever. That stuff becomes really important to them at that age. They become very petty. And if you can pull them out of that mindset at that age and make them care about things beyond themselves, helping other people, seeing what suffering looks like and helping with that, you know, like recently, for example, with the disaster of the, you know, the storm that hit and all those people in New Jersey and New York and all of this is not too far from you guys. If you did a, a weekend trip every weekend with some, with the Red Cross or anybody else, and you went and just helped out people whose homes are destroyed or there's a tree in their driveway or something and just went and helped and came back. If you just did that, it, it would, I'm telling you, it will bring you closer to Allah like nothing else. You do these three things and you're, you've at least met the foundational goals to do great things in life. This is not your goal. These are, the, these are the things you've met so you can actually achieve goals. Now let's talk about your goals. I tell Muslim youth, because if you're, if you're this, you're probably going to med school, so if you're going to be a doctor, don't aim to be a doctor. Aim to own a hospital. Don't, what are you going to be a doctor for? You, you're the guy that, you're not just going to be a doctor, you're going to run Doctors Without Borders. You're going to transform the medical industry. You're not just going into pharmaceuticals. You're going to clean up that industry. You're not just, you're not just doing an MBA to do a you know, get a business degree and get a job at a blood-sucking corporation. Get your MBA, be an entrepreneur, and start a socially responsible entrepreneurial you know, company that provides a, a great service to humanity and at the same time is worth multi, multiple millions that gives back to the community. Think big, don't think small. And part of thinking big is thinking entrepreneurially, thinking creatively. You're at the age now, the younger people in this audience are of the age right now where you are full of really cool ideas. You're full of really neat ideas. But you know what happens to your ideas? Yeah, I got this idea for a website. It's gonna be awesome. And you're sitting next to your friend while you're, this website is gonna transform the world. And your friend next to you is like, yeah, it's pretty awesome. But you won't do anything with it. You'll do nothing with it. You got me another one? Okay, cool. If you have an idea, work towards it. Run with it. Be entrepreneurial. And do it. It's not once you graduate from college or once you finish this or that, then you can venture into those things. Do them when you're a teen. Do stuff when you're a teen. If you have an idea, run it by people that are successful in business or in entrepreneurship. Discuss your idea with them. Refine it. See how you can get started. And you don't always think you need to have big investment capital to start something. All you need is a good idea and work ethic, and you can start something. And you can be huge. You can be huge. That's what the Ummah needs. The Ummah needs creative entrepreneurs. The few that we have, the few entrepreneurs that we have are, are driving, the, they're actually shaping the direction of the community. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, we have enough doctors. We have enough programmers. Don't be a programmer to work at a company. Start your own firm, make the next ama most amazing, most downloaded app. You should do that. That's what you guys should be. And when we do that, I, I tell Muslims to do this. You know why? Because we have to understand the new language of power in the world is economics. We have to understand that. Right now we're struggling to even pay for our masajid in America. We are some of the most well-off Muslims in the planet. And we have a hard time paying off. We don't even have an economically sustainable model for our own masajid, our own schools. That's because we haven't thought big enough. We have to learn to start thinking big. And we have to develop a work ethic for it. But the barakah, the blessings in that, in that creative work will come when the foundation I talked about is already there. 
if your salawat are good, your worship is solid, your knowledge is increasing, and you're serving humanity, your mind will be in the right place, and Allah will put barakah in your business. Allah will put barakah in your entrepreneurial venture. And He will not let you become a materialist and a, you know, and a greedy capitalist. He'll make you a socially responsible entrepreneur that will make this country and inshallah the world a better place. And we're not just here to serve the ummah, we're here to fix the world. You have to think that big. You have to aim that high. Don't shortchange yourself. Don't underestimate yourself. And even though we are just at the end of the day slaves of Allah, and we are the lowest before Him, the closest we are to Allah is when we put ourselves the lowest on the ground. That's our humility to Allah. But when Allah gives you a gift, and Allah gives you intelligence, and Allah gives you an ed educational opportunity, and Allah gives you a creative idea, and Allah gifts you with a talent, and you say, I'm way too humble to exercise my talent, then that is not humility, that is ingratitude. That is ingratitude. You have to exercise your talents. You have to make the most of yourself. Tell them everybody should work in accordance with their predisposition. Every one of you has a predisposition. You have a talent. You're good at something. Find out what that is and find out how you're going to use it to its maximum potential so you become a contributor to the world, not a consumer. Everybody else, their own goals, their own bank account, their own savings, their own fashion. Their, oh man, one day I'm going to drive that car. I'm going to have that kind of house. That's all they think about. We're going to say, one day I'm going to make people come out of poverty in this neighborhood. One day I'm going to transform the school systems in my town. I'm going to make the city a different place than it is now. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave you, I know I have time, my time's up, but I want to leave you with a really cool story. I thought it was, I was really floored and inspired by it. Last week, I met, uh, uh, two weeks ago actually, I met a, a brother in New Jersey at the American Muslim Consumer Conference. Uh, he's the mayor of Bergen County, New Jersey. And the mayor of Bergen County, New Jersey, Alhamdulillah, is a Muslim fellow, young man, who actually prays Fajr every morning at the masjid. Alhamdulillah. And he, you know, people at the masjid, of course, treat him like garbage because we're Muslims. And, but let me tell you something about him. I said, how did you win the election? I mean, you're clearly brown. And you're openly super Muslim. He doesn't hide it that he's religious and he's Muslim and he's conservative, et cetera, et cetera. And the, you know, it's a majority, almost 90% is Jewish population in that county. It's a very heavy Jewish population. There's more synagogues there than the rest of New Jersey. So how, how did you win the election? He goes, I, I didn't win, I went twice. I was like, oh, sorry. First time 56%, second time 85% of the vote. I said, how did you do that? He said, well, I went into public service with the belief that I'm here to serve the public, my public. I have political views about Gaza. I have political views about you know, drone strikes. I have those views, and I openly state them, but I also openly state none of my political views matter when I am serving public office because I am here to serve you people. So I go to the synagogues, and I go to the businesses, and I go to the stores, and I go to the offices without the reporters, without a press release. I just walk in and I say, hey, how's it going? I'm the mayor of this town. How can I make your life better? I'm just here to serve because I want to see the city improve. And I'm just going to serve. And people see that for what it is and I get the vote. I say, man, that is awesome. That's what a Muslim is supposed to be like. Ihsan, you know? I'm going to do something and I'm going to do it better than anybody else has done it. And I'm going to let my work speak for itself. No banner, no advertising campaign. He doesn't have to put up a whole advertising campaign that I'm a Muslim, but I'm not crazy. Please vote for me. I'm not like the other crazy guys. I wasn't, you know, one of the, one of the 11 or whatever. One of the 19. I'm not one of those guys. He doesn't have to do that. He lets his work speak for himself. It's high time the Muslims stop crying that we're being stereotyped against. People, people say th assume things about us. They make fun of us. They say offensive things about us. They make films about us. It's high time now that our work speaks for itself. Our contribution to society speaks for itself. That will shut everybody else up better than anything else. Let the actions speak and the words will be silenced themselves. I pray that you are the generation that makes us look back and say, MashaAllah, we did something right. 
We created, we, we raised a generation that Allah put barakah in and they were the entrepreneurs and they were the pioneers of the ummah to come. Think big of yourselves and don't live petty lives. And when you, when you get a sense of vision and direction in your young age, then your youth will be spent exhausting those energies in the right direction. Otherwise, you'll be people of PlayStation 3s and Xbox 360s and Facebooks and Twitter, and that's all your life will amount to. You won't be much after that. You'll just be a consumer. You're, you're the biggest thing you're looking forward to is the next upgrade to the iPhone. Get over it. There's bigger things in life. You're here to do more important things. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.